Hi, everybody. This is Don Spears, and we are recording our new topic for the week. And this is the podcast Human Services in Porter County. And we've got a, a topic that our group is very enthusiastic about discussing, and I am too. And it's something that I think affects just about all of us in one way or another. And it's gonna be different for so many people. But today we're gonna to be talking about happiness and how is it that each person, you know, maybe it isn't defined differently among different people, or maybe we have consensus as far as to what happiness is. We'll see as we go into our discussion but we're going to try to figure out what in the heck happiness is and then what is it that makes somebody happy and then what we can do to try to to help make ourselves and other people more happy as well so we're going to start off and we're going to go around and do introductions and probably the, the most orderly way to do it was for me to go clockwise, uh, according to my screen. So, um, Ryan, if you'd please introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Ryan Olenkowski. I'm a executive director at St. Jude House. We're a family violence prevention center and domestic violence shelter. And I am joined uh, for this first part uh, with my daughters, Lily and Lila. And uh, really happy to be here. I think this is a very interesting topic. I'm also eager to hear everyone's uh, perspective and view um, regarding happiness. I think it's just a, a fascinating uh, thing to discuss. And thanks for having uh, me on today, Don. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, Ryan. Leanne, could you introduce yourself? Yes, I will. Hello, I'm Leanne Repton. I am a full-time employee at Ivy Tech Community College, where I work at the systems office doing our internal talent and professional development. So I work with employees uh, after teaching full-time for numerous years, public speaking and communication. And I actually live in Kentucky and was really intrigued by this topic because uh, lately I have been doing presentations on reframing and the power of positive thinking and how we can, the, the aspects that we can control when it comes to this topic. So I, I was very excited about it and looking forward to the discussion. Great. And you know, if you ever need a side gig, you really have a radio voice. You sound good over the microphone. So wow. if, if you're ever looking to do something, you should start a radio show. <laughs> Thank you, Don. I do have some friends in the radio and I do teach Pilates reformer for fun. And some of my clients say that I have a very soothing voice. They say you, it's very relaxing. So that's you, you very do. helpful feedback. I Thank feel you. more relaxed as it is. But the thought of Pilates for fun, that sounds like an oxymoron to me. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Julie, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. My name is Julie Yak, and I am in Colorado, but I grew up in Indiana. Uh, I've been friends with our host for nearly 40 years. He's that old. Um, <laughs> and I'm not I the only one who's that old. <laughs> I own a training and workforce development company in Colorado, and we focus on um, helping folks find their what's new. Um, we've got a lot of students from um, globally impoverished areas and people who are the career switchers, the people leaving poor relationships, things like that. Um, and I've just been focused this year on doing as many cohorts as possible. And we've brought through about a thousand students so far this year. Wow. Well, I knew you were busy, but I didn't know you were that <laughs> busy. Holy smokes. Thank you, Julie. And Nico, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. My name is Nico Melendez. I've known Don for about over a decade now, on and off. Uh, 
I am a former student of his. I now work as a member for uh, AmeriCorps for United Way of Northwest Indiana. Um, I'm working as a tutor and a mentor at Portage High School in Portage, Indiana, which is where I'm from. Uh, it's home. And what I get to do is I get to work with uh, the students. Most of them are at-risk students uh, in credit recovery. So getting to work with them one-on-one -on -one and just trying to be a positive influence and in showing them the importance of finishing and receiving a high school education and getting the diploma uh, and what that can lead uh, for them to better their future, hopefully. Great. Thank you, Nico. And if you didn't notice when Nico was introducing himself, he really stressed Don because uh, he had been, he'd had to call me Professor Spears while he was studying, and now he's just really enjoying being able to, now that we're uh, adult friends, him being able to call me Don. So that was purely intentional on his part. And well, I saw I mean, I that little twinkle in his eye. I think it was more appropriate than just old man Spears. Uh, That's what he usually calls me now. Yeah. So I should have shut up and stuck with Don. Oh, well. Okay. And uh, as people who follow the uh, podcast know, I'm Don Spears. I am professor and chair of human services at Ivy Tech Community College in the Valparaiso campus, which is in Porter County. So as I said, uh, today's topic is happiness. Um, and we're going to try to sort out exactly what that means, if that's even possible, and what we can do to get more happiness in our lives, and what are some of the things that prevent us from being as happy as we'd like. And I think what I would like to do first is share some statistics for just a moment with you all. You should be able to see now, I hope so, the Kaiser Family Foundation and their uh, results from research that was done as of February 2023. So these are quite uh, recent data that we have. And um, those who are not familiar with the diagnostic tools that they use, uh, the two that are listed, uh, the GAD for generalized anxiety disorder, that is a standard that is used, as is the PHQ-2 for uh, depression. So what we're seeing in this is that for all adults, nearly a third uh, report that they have symptoms of anxiety and or depression. And then something that I found uh, interesting is the breakdown by age. The most depressed group, and this is not just this year, but there's a, a collection of data that show that young adults are more depressed than older people. And one of the things maybe that we'll have time to talk about today is why are people who are 65 plus, I mean, that's uh, less than half of the rate than people who are 18 to 24, which is, practically 50% for them. And then you see for the other age breakdowns, 25 to 49 is 38% and 50 to 64 is 29.3%. So these are very high numbers and these are only among those who have been uh, tested. So, um, I've had forgotten to click share, so I don't think that you saw those, but I did make them up, I promise. And see, Julie, I told you I would screw it up. 
Wow, okay. he's fumbling already. We're not even 10 minutes into the recording. Jeez. Nico, oh, I got to point this way because it's backwards. Behave yourself. Okay. So th those are really alarming uh, rates. And those are among those who have completed um, these assessments. So I suspect in the real world, it's probably significantly higher than that for a number of reasons. But let's see if I can at least change to the proper view. There we go. There's, I think I got it right. And so um, the first question that I would like to ask is generally, what is happiness to you? So for anyone who would like to address that, I would love to hear your thoughts about what, how do you define happiness? And feel free to just jump in and we're going to make this as uh, conversational as, as we can. So I'll jump in. Happiness is a moving target. Today's happy is not the same thing as yesterday's happy. Um, so today I've got beautiful blue skies and pleasant temperatures. So today's happy was going in the backyard and throwing the ball with the dogs. Um, and tomorrow it's going to have monsoon rain. So tomorrow's happy can't be going out in the yard with the dogs. Right. And so uh, tomorrow's happy is going to be this all day cooking thing that I'm going to do to get these wonderful tacos in the evening. Um, but different days bring different happy. OK, that's a good point. Who else? That, was really, that was really good, Julie. I think that was a it's it's so hard to define. Um, but speaking, I think, Don, if I'm understanding the question for, for our own self, right, uh, we define mm -hmm. that personally. Um, you know, I think about joy, um, you know, what brings us joy and more importantly to reach a level of happiness is to not let anyone steal your joy. And I think something I've been studying and, and working on is, you know, when we change the paradigm of our thought process, um, you know, I think that can also, you know, being very intentional um, about our thoughts. And I think as humans, anyone who ever says they don't have any level of anxiety or negative thinking, um, I'd like to meet that person who 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 never has uh, those thoughts, right? Um, so working on, you know, not letting those thoughts consume us, because again, that to me takes away my joy um, and happiness. But I agree with Julie so much that, you know, it's so hard to define and it can change. Um, you know, we look at our environment or circumstances um, with our relationships, but for me also just being connected, you know, family, I like to lean into faith um, and, and positive people. That's what uh, really helps me uh, feel happy. Um, there's an author um, that wrote a book called The Energy Bus that talks about energy vampires, you know, not to get too far. Uh, I don't wanna take up too much time with, with this, First question, but um, for me, is, you know, being happy is being around, um, you know, people that are also in a, you know, a good space and not that we're always all in a good space, but sometimes if you're around toxicity too often, it can definitely steal your joy or steal my happiness, speaking for myself. Okay. I'll piggyback on both of those because I had the feeling you were going to ask this question uh -huh. and I was thinking about the difference between joy and happiness and very similar, very similar thoughts to what Julie and Ryan said that there's a lot of subjectivity to happiness that we're all driven in different ways. So what makes me happy right now, maybe doesn't tomorrow, like Julie said, but also may never make Ryan happy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's all within, and in, in ways, there's some of that, I think that we can choose but that difference between happiness and joy, that that happiness is a bit temporal and joy is a bit more longer lasting. And I think for me, it's finding purpose in what I'm doing, understanding the why behind things. And so I, I think that's a big part of it. Also understanding, and I, I'm curious about the data, Don, that you shared, because I wonder 
is it just as we age, generally speaking, that we get happier? Or is it this generation, right? And so I wonder about a couple of things like, one, this idea of what we can control and what we can't. And I know for myself, once I realized like, there's so few things I can control, why bother? Why worry? And like Ryan, I'm very faith-based. And so for me, it's like, I'm, I feel like, you know, they're, for me, like thinking of the Bible, it's over and over, do not worry, worry for nothing, don't be anxious. And so the more you can let go of things, the, the happier I think you can be. And then also just the experience of how much others influence that. So I think about social media and how not many of us here on this podcast today grew up with social media. And so that's where I'm wondering about those differences in the the data, because if somebody is growing up with social media, they're, they've been impacted by others their entire lives. Like they're driven by the likes and the, and all of the comments on social media, whereas, you know, I didn't grow up that way. So while I think it's great, I love words of affirmation and I love feeling affirmed. I don't necessarily need that to feel happy or fulfilled. Like it's a great boost, but I I can find it in other ways. So I think that, and again, like I mentioned at the start, reframing is a huge piece. So I think there's certain things that we can cognitively recognize within ourselves that these automatic negative thoughts, these ants that, that come in, right. That we can recognize them and then turn those around. And again, you know, so back to control, like we do have more control over our own thinking than maybe we think we do, but we can't control very much outside of that. Right. And I like that both of the aspects that you mentioned, particularly in, you know, as you were winding down your answer, because you, much of what you were talking about fits under what in human services we would call cognitive behavioral therapy, which means that in order to change your behaviors, you first work on your thoughts. That will change the way you feel about yourself. And then when you feel better about yourself, you will change your behaviors and uh, engage in things that bring you happiness or joy. And um, so that, that's been well established and um, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, it's the most commonly used form of psychotherapy right now. So you're really on to something with that. And I also liked that toward the end, you mentioned identifying things that are within your control and those that are not. Because there's the environment has a big influence too. And we'll no doubt get to that as our conversation continues. But if you live in just miserable situations and you've got poverty and violence and all sorts of, in some countries, war, it's awfully difficult to you know, reframe that and look at that in a positive way. Although um, it, there's something called logotherapy and that was uh, put together uh, by a man who was in a concentration camp where he found meaning in life there and he was released, he was liberated. He was a, a young man when he was in the concentration camp and uh, it's just amazing how he found the will to keep going. So even in very difficult situations, while it's challenging to put it mildly, uh, to be able to find happiness and joy when you're living surrounded by, you know, things that are ugly and dangerous and and so forth, um, there is only so much that that we can do. So that kind of goes against the myth. And I'm glad that, that you brought it up, you know, that everything is within the control of the individual. You know, that's not so. Sometimes it's more than we realize, but there is a lot. Uh, if you've got a lot of advantages, 
you know, money doesn't bring you happiness, but it certainly eliminates a lot of the things that makes you unhappy. So I, I appreciate your, your comments and your analysis. Uh, let's see, we've got, has everybody, who do we have? Nico. Look at him hiding in the shadows there. Nico. Yeah, uh, I'll kind of piggyback off of all three of you uh, that went ahead of me. I think living in the moment uh, in the sense of somebody said earlier, you know, finding a purpose or having a purpose. I think if you have a reason to get up every morning and you're able to kind of share that with the world, like, hey, I'm going to go do this. Let me see if I can help somebody else or bring somebody along with me on the ride, so to speak. And then see what they what they're into, or or how they can branch out and do their own thing. And then it's almost like you're spreading the message, uh, you know, not to go, you know, biblical here, but if you're like spreading the gospel of whatever that is, and you're sharing the good news of the world and the good news of today, that's gonna brighten somebody else's day, and that's gonna change their mood, and so on and so forth. Uh, Spears, you just used an analogy of someone uh, that who that was in a concentration camp when they were younger maybe they saw something from the outside world of wow the people outside these walls they get to do all this i want that one day okay that's going to drive me to keep me going to motivate me to stay alive you know um i think it was ryan who also talked about faith based that too if you get, get into your word whatever that whatever that is whatever you know beliefs you have that instantly changes your mood uh most of the time positively when you get to read and you get to understand things um so and i would just say like i said living in the moment you know everything you're like okay i'm gonna go do this today and then just go do it and then if for some reason that doesn't work out you're like oh at least i tried this but i was able to go do this so i didn't get everything done but i did this mostly so good thank you um uh, you all pretty much have brought up faith as being an important part of your own joy. Uh, I recognize the importance of that for many people, but I want to just kind of throw out that I don't personally feel that it's necessary for every individual. You can be uh, a completely secular person and you can still find joy and happiness in your life so it's uh you know more people are spiritual or religious than will report on surveys that they are an atheist or agnostic but the data are changing and people are moving away from formal uh worship services and more people are identifying themselves as being spiritual and that can be exercised in any number of ways so um, i just did want to you know kind of put out there that while we do have a pretty good consensus that as individuals uh, religion or faith or spirituality is extremely helpful to you. I think that there can be people without religious faith who can be just as happy. Uh, I was the one who didn't bring it up. Um, and while I respect that it brings comfort to many people, it doesn't to me. I grew up in a very toxic environment and church was a big part of that. So mm -hmm. As an adult, I call myself a hopeful skeptic, um, but I don't find comfort in that. It, it's it's not on my path. Yeah, yeah, and and I'll say too, I'm not a a person of faith, and it just uh, it, I think it's one of those things that it either registers for you or it just doesn't, you know, and. I'm with you. I don't judge anybody else. And I think we all just need to be accepting because nobody, the only people who know 
can't tell or they're not telling they're keeping a very good secret so uh you know that that's one segment that many people uh find brings them uh joy or happiness but it is very important to know that it probably is not a necessity. So um, my next question, because I very much believe that if one thing exists, it exists in comparison to the opposite. So if we're talking about happiness, we have to talk about sadness and I think we also need to realize that there's a difference between sadness and depression too. So how would you all respond to adding in the variable of sadness and depression as opposed to happiness and joy? I mean, it's the, it's, it's the counter to happiness and joy um unfortunately we we don't live in a perfect world so you see things of like whatever is going on in the world that would affect someone negatively or even if it affects you negatively or whatever you have going on in your daily life and the only way i feel that that sadness turns into depression if it's just one thing on top of the other constantly like if it's just layers that like build i mean we've talked about this in numerous of your classes spheres where you can be sad and you could be having a rough day but then when it's one thing on top of the next thing and then you're just and you get overwhelmed then maybe the depression starts to creep in a little bit but and i'm losing my train of thought about what i was going to say next i think without that without that sadness a little bit you then you kind of don't appreciate those happy moments you don't appreciate the joyous moments of like okay you know this is going to turn around eventually for whatever reason whether it's you got to work towards something you had a setback so now you got to have a bounce back you know or whether you just got to ride it out and then it, it'll there's always an, a, a new day tomorrow and tomorrow you know they say the sun will come out tomorrow tomorrow will be better so mm -hmm. go to that very good. Anybody so, else? As, as I had mentioned, I grew up in a very toxic environment. I married into a toxic marriage, and misery was just the way of life. That was just every day. People around me were miserable. I was miserable. That's just the way it was. And then once I removed all those obstacles, once I got the divorce, once I had a happy marriage, once I had financial stability, healthy kids, all of those obstacles to my happiness were gone, I was still crying every single day. And that was when my doctor and I discussed depression and the need for medication. And I think that that was probably the most important conversation I've ever had in my life with anyone. Because um, for me, my depression was the crying, but I could easily see how uncontrolled it would lead to a much darker path. Yeah. And so um, for 20 ish years or so now, I've been very healthy and happy with a full range of emotions um, on an antidepressant that works for me. That was probably a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. Julie, you know, thank you so much for, for sharing that. You know, often in my line of work, we challenge the stigma around domestic violence, but I think it's very important and powerful when we challenge the stigma around mental health and, and depression. So you just being vulnerable and sharing that um, and knowing that this will be out there can, can truly help someone because, you know, we need to be able to talk about depression. And I think depression and sadness, you know, Two, two different things, right? I mean, you could see some correlation, but um, like what you said is very powerful. Sometimes being able to talk to a professional and have um, medication is a game changer um, for so many people. But I think we're in the year, what, 2023? And we're just, I've heard more and more people talking about, you know, whether they're reaching out and, you know, having a therapist or a doctor and, and talking about it. And the same thing with domestic violence, the parallel, the more we talk about it, um, the more acceptable it is and easier for people to be vulnerable and get help. So I just wanted to say, you know, I really appreciate you sharing that. 
Yes, I that agree. that was very brave. And we I appreciate it as well because I couldn't agree with you more, Ryan. You know, it's something that, you know, going back, you know, hundreds of years when mental uh, health was viewed as, you know, you had demons in your skull and we found uh, skulls where they drilled holes in, so that the evil spirits could get out. And from that point on, there's just always been a stigma associated with that. And what I would love to see, and I, I'm sure everybody in this conversation would love to see, is us getting to the point as a society where we view mental health the same that way that we would any other type of health. I would not be ashamed to go see the doctor because I had pneumonia. Why should I be ashamed to go to the doctor because I'm depressed or anxious? And for, for lay people um, who may not realize because anxiety and depression kind of at first glance sound like opposites of each other, but they're really two sides of the same coin because they feed into each other. And when people go and you're struggling with both, oftentimes they'll be prescribed an antidepressant that also works on anxiety. And in therapy, you work on focusing on both sides of that too. And I just think of the number of people who suffer needlessly because either for cultural factors or uh, down to the family level or the individual, we feel shame. And it's just because you're assumed to be weak or if I had a better uh, religious life, you know, I would be able to work my way through this. And I don't think that it has to do with either necessarily. So um, I agree. Kudos to Julie for sharing that. It was very, uh, it was very brave and I appreciate it. And, and I'm going to disagree with you. I think it was very ordinary. I don't think it was brave in any capacity. I think it's the equivalent of talking about high blood pressure. I think, I'm glad that you I do. I think it was ordinary and I think it needs to be an ordinary conversation. I agree. You yeah, it, it's a shame that Ryan and I feel as though we need to acknowledge that you were brave to say that, because I'm on the same page as you, but there's a lot of people who are not. So that it had a big impact on your life and your ability to uh, experience happiness and I'm glad you went and got help. And we need to get you on the lecture circuit where you talk to people about no stigma. It, it, you don't have to be brave. And maybe one day we'll get to where more people are feeling that way. So I do conference talks and things like that, but they're about technology. And I have on many occasions used my audience in that capacity to acknowledge things that people don't like to talk about. And this included that mm -hmm. um, it was life changing. Excellent. Well, I think it does. Sometime when you're back in Indiana visiting us, uh, I'll get you into the college and we'll have mm -hmm. you give a talk. You, you say that like I'm looking forward to going back to Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> now, stop it. Some of us <laughs> live here on purpose. You've seen the pictures of where I live. Come on. <laughs> I have. I have. Leanne, you were you were had something that you wanted to share. Yeah, I well, first I was going to just mention that, you know, to Julie, it doesn't seem unusual. I think because when it's your story, it doesn't feel like that too. Um, and also I think it gets into like what's normal for one person. And again, back to like what makes one person happy isn't the same for somebody else. So um to your question, a couple of things I was thinking. One, when teaching interpersonal communication, we talk about emotions and the language that we use for emotions. We very clearly explain that depression is not an emotion. 
it's a, a diagnosis. And so um, when people say, I feel depressed, it's actually not the right language to use when talking about it because mm -hmm. it's a DSM, as you know, Don, from the Diagnostic and Statistic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, it's a clinical diagnosis. And so I think we're talking about different, like sadness and depression are in yes. completely different categories. Absolutely. Um, and so I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't think that I've ever maybe in points of my life have I experienced an aspect of depression, but I don't think I would ever be clinically diagnosed. And so when you're not, when you don't have that experience, it's really hard to say. And so you might look at somebody else and go like, well, pull yourself out of it. What's going on? But you, you've got to have that diagnosis and that, that medication. And that's why it's so important to, to talk to somebody about that. And so like for me, you know, when I'm experiencing sadness or like extreme, extreme, um, levels of sadness, maybe even like, um, extreme fatigue or like whatever might contribute to that. Right. Um, I personally, you know, I have a lot of friends who are medicated and they say great things about it. And I'm like, that's amazing. I, I'm not somebody who would ever want to, and it's probably goes back into control. I have clearly, I have a, some control issues as I work on other things. I don't want to be dependent on something else. So that's, that's my, um, another reason that like, I, you know, wouldn't want, you know, somebody to say, Hey, have you, will you try this? Cause I know like, you've got to level it up and then you've got to pare it down. If you go off of it and you've got to try different things. And I know all the things that are involved there. So, um, but I also want to say that this, your initial question made me think about the, that movie inside out and how, you know, the premise of it, something that, again, we talk about with language and our emotions is that as a society, we're so limited by the way we describe our emotions. We have this wide repertoire of vocabulary we could use, but we, we limit this to very like, you know, just happiness and sadness. And like, there are so many more. And, and that movie talks about how really they coexist. So it's, it's very rare that we're like, oh, you know, no one's happy all the time. Hopefully no one's sad all the time, but they, they intermingle. And I, I love what Nico said, where it's like, you almost have to know the one to know the other. Like, how do you, why do you appreciate being healthy? Because we've been sick before and it's horrible. And so, you know, then we're healthy and we're like, oh my gosh, this is so great. And then we forget and then we're sick again. Right. And so I think similar things happen with our emotions, but you know, um, something like, like, like a celebration of life. Of course, that's been a little bit changed in the way we talk about funerals as a celebration of life. And I love that because it's just a fact of life. And so that, you know, focusing on it on that way, it's sad. It's incredibly sad, but it's also can be extremely happy, right? To think about that person that we loved and to celebrate that. So that, I think those are the things that were going on in my head as we were, as I was also listening and processing what everybody else was saying. Well, I, I love that because your head was going where my head was going as well, because I wanted to point out that there is a big difference between being sad and being depressed and the fact that it is a clinical disorder that can only be diagnosed by a licensed professional. And uh, one thing that I've thought uh, fairly frequently is that I wish that uh, general practitioners, when you would go in for your annual wellness check, they would do a quick depression screening um, because there, there are people um, who have different opinions on medications and you know I have my opinions as well. Um, and you can get to a point with, um, and I don't want to belabor depression because we're supposed to be talking about happiness. But if you're depressed, it's hard to be happy. But, uh, you know, if you get started on medication, because people can get so far down in the funk of a depression that it does not matter what a therapist or a priest or a counselor or anybody else is going to tell you you're just going to be miserable. So uh, it, I think it is very important that we do consult our, our healthcare professionals and let them make the decisions. And uh, 
people, if there's anyone, and I think Ryan mentioned this, if there's anybody who said that they've never been sad, I would have to call BS on them. I mean, that's natural life. You know, we, and there are times where it's very appropriate to be sad. You should be sad when certain things happen. But on the other side, getting back to happiness, there are times when we should feel not just happy, but joyful or ecstatic, you know, um, something fabulous happens to you or somebody that you care a lot about, you should be able to feel those emotions. So with the... I would say fulfilled is another word too. Say that again, Nico. I would say fulfilled is another word too. That is a very good choice of words and it's it's actually a direction that i was heading in because in the data that i thought i was showing you but i actually was telling you about um i i mentioned the trend where let me try it again i think i know what i forgot to do and julie don't laugh at me Okay, share. We forgot to hit share screen, folks. We forgot to hit share screen. Screen to share. Can you see it now? Yeah. You got something. All right. Yay. Woohoo. Look at that. You figured, you figured I'm such out. a. I bet you want to hire me now, Julie, don't you? I want to pay you to train other people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here are the data. And, um, it was, I think it may have been Leanne who had asked about this particular dynamic here. And from what I recall from studies over time, even before social media became as uh, ubiquitous as it is right now, uh, it still carried this similar type of uh, formation where younger people are less happy and older people are uh, report less of unhappiness or anxiety or depression. So I'm going to try to stop sharing here. Look at that. I'm getting fancy. <laughs> Julie looks very proud of me. <laughs> I'm quite proud of myself. I want a sticker or something for my shirt because that made me feel happy. Um, so your numbers don't surprise me in the slightest. Um, and this is from someone who is not in the same field as you in any capacity. Um, what I see in those numbers mm -hmm. is the 18 to 24 year olds are they're adults now. Being an adult is a whole lot different than being a teenager. And those first few years of being an adult can be very, very overwhelming. And those are the, the ones who are starting to self-reflect and have the independence to be able to make decisions for themselves. Um, the folks in the middle, that's us, we're the ones that know that we should be going to therapy, know that we should get medication if we need to. And then the, the older category, that's the generation who won't talk about it. That's the generation who would never self-identify as being depressed or having any sort of mental illness. And so your numbers make perfect sense to me. Let's hear other people's responses to that. Was anybody surprised? Not really. Uh, mainly because it's, it, I think it's all just about generation, generational upbringing. Um, we don't have, or we didn't have back then what we have now in regards to technology and everybody all of a sudden is an expert. And yeah, some people are, I'm not knocking anybody in their expertise in their field by any means, but I'm like, wait, I can't comment or ex say something because somebody who's my elder experienced life way different than I did. So if they're feeling some type of way, cool, let them be. I guarantee you, you can probably learn more from your elders than you probably could um, 
you know, the newer generation, and I'm not knocking, you know, the newer generation or anything like that, they are far way advanced on technology than I will ever be. Uh, I got two younger siblings that I love more than anything in this world, and the way they can quickly figure out things uh, in regards to technology or even basic, you know, math, and I'm over here like, wait, well, how do you do this? Like, what? Um, so, but I still think we can't really compare or just like speak on somebody's gener pre the previous generation if we haven't lived it if we didn't go through it yeah we can look at a history book you can watch a documentary to understand it to an extent but unless you lived it you can't really comment on it okay i to add a little bit to the perspective of these data this is not just a general uh, or generational uh, phenomena that's going on here. We have seen in data from prior decades a similar pattern. So uh, I, I think certainly there's a matter of younger people are more willing to uh, acknowledge uh, crises or difficulties with their mental health than older folks do. But I suspect that there's more to it than that. What Ryan's nodding. What do you think, Ryan? Well, I think, I mean, there's, there's so many possibilities. I'm sure this would be really hard to pin down, but I think that when we look at this again, not thinking generation, Don, just looking at these age brackets um, as we journey through life. Um, I know like, well, both of my parents, you know, have passed, but at one time there's this thing called the sandwich generation. And that's when you're taking care of young children and your parents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like someone mentioned earlier, you know, life, it is, it's, it's definitely a, a cycle. I think it was uh, Leanne, right? I, I mean, it is special when we do celebrate, um, someone's life. Um, so I think that as we get older, I know even looking at my parents there, I'm starting to appreciate a much deeper appreciation with, with my daughters of really the sacrifices that they did for us to provide. And, you know, some of those different stresses, when you look at finances and, you know, your career and your family and learning to prioritize those, I think as that older generation gets older, um, and Julie, to your point, there there probably are uh, people that are, um, you know, classified as seniors that may not ever share what they're going through. But I think that lived experience at that time, or we define that as maybe wisdom and knowledge about life, and then the deep appreciation of, um, you know, raising a family or or those accomplishments and leaning into a retirement. Um, I think that when you don't have some of the other stressors, and we know that, like Don, you said, money doesn't certainly um, bring happiness, you know. Um, but what I'm getting at is I think when you, you do have security and, and your family is doing well and, and you can really just have safe, stable, nurturing relationships, um, one thing we, we haven't touched on is um, loneliness. And that's something we've studied in, you know, in depth um recently and again us just being being connected and i think that that older generation i what i observed when my mom was alive the relationship between her and my daughter uh, i would never understand a grandparent relationship until i got to see my own child uh, with my mother and that's a very special relationship and we often say why do grandparents spoil kids right it's because they're they're not their children right it's their grandbabies um i don't know if that all makes sense i could be rambling but I just look at it a little bit different, Julie, I think, and I'm not there yet. I'm, you know, I talk about age and floor, so I'm just, I'm on the fourth floor. So I know I have a lot to learn still, but I, I appreciate the journey of learning and being a student constantly. And I don't know what that's going to look like when I'm in that age group, but this, the only sad thing about that is being that happy when you get to that point is we know that our health, then we just talk about our physical health, then our bodies slow down. And it's like, so I want to personally, and I want my team and, and my family to to enjoy each day as much as we can, because, you know, truly tomorrow's never promised, right? 
Mm-hmm. All right, I'll stop talking, Don. B- back over to back over to you. <laughs> Sounds like you just gave the weather report. Now it's back right, to right. Your death. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, I I loved uh, that you shared like that, and you brought up some really important points that you're an individual's place in their lifespan also has an influence on their psychology and their focus. And there's, there have been um, research, there's been research that's been published that shows or hypothesizes that some of that improvement of mood that was demonstrated in the data where the happiest group out of all of the categories that we gave was those who were 65 plus, their focus tends to be different than people who are in the 18 to 24 and uh, 25 to 49 categories. And you know, I can tell you I'm above the fourth floor. So uh, <laughs> your perspective does change. You know, when you get, when when your kiddos get a little older and you get to see them accomplishing things and you take pride in that and you know that ideally, because of course there are always you know, uh, problematic situations more than there should be. But ideally, I've played a part in my son's success. And he's going to go out and have his successes, but I get to enjoy a piece of that because I was involved. And I'm focusing less on myself. And I can tell you, too, as an educator, And particularly at the um, community college level where I teach. So I get to see students finish their two-year degree. And many of them, if not most, they say, I want to be a therapist. So I get to see them start off and they get through their first two years and they do well, and I get to write a reference letter for them to get into their bachelor of social work program. They get in, they invite me to graduation, and I go, and then I'm writing reference letters for them to get into their master of social work program. They finish that, and now, you know, because I'm above the fourth floor, I've got so many students who are therapists out there and to be able, you know, I take pride in them myself. I tell them that whether you like it or not, you know, you're, you're one of mine. And uh, I take pride in playing just at least the, the tiniest part in that. And when I see you succeed, I take, you know, so much pride and so much joy out of that. You're the one who changed your life. Maybe I provided a little bit of inspiration or uh, encouragement when you needed it, but you took advantage of what was given to you. So we we can get that vicarious joy through our own children, through our clients, through our students. And as we get older, our focus does uh, move away from ourselves and toward the bigger picture and leaving the world a better place. And the, the humanistic theorists in counseling and uh, Adler was really big on talking about that. And it, So many people have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and getting up to self-actualization. To me, that's where real happiness and joy uh, really becomes real 
for for people. So that I attribute a lot of the trend that we see there as being a change in focus. Is when you're 18 to 24, you know, people have brought up and it's unavoidable social media and its influence, but especially those who are right now 18 to 24, they've never known another world. And when we were kids, if you were being bullied, you'd go home and you'd at least have a break when you weren't at school because hopefully mom and dad weren't bullying you. So you you didn't have this constant ab abuse, you know, that, that's being heaped upon you. And it seems, you know, to somebody my age, you know, if, if my son was saying people are bullying me online, I'd say, well, turn it off and don't look at it. But, you know, young people now, they're, they're, um, their phones and tablets it's like a, an appendage like if you took it away from them it would be as though you were amputating a part of their body and they can't imagine being away from it so i think that that too you know they kids get up in the night they go to the bathroom they take their phone they look and see what people are saying about them they're under a tremendous microscope way worse than we were kids. So what does anybody else think about either the trends that we've talked about or what is it that brings ultimate happiness, things that get in the way, what we can do to help? I mean, I'm kind of opening it up here because we've been going for quite a while and I want to be respectful of people's time, but uh, I'll open it up to anything that has been going through your mind that you thought you would like to raise or bring to people's awareness. So no, what can we do to help our crisis of happiness? Don, if I could just say one more thing, and, and, and my apologies, I, I really haven't seen my family much this week. Um, so I'm going to, we're going to jump in a pool actually. So um, I just want to leave, you know, I appreciate everyone. Um, this was such a, a great experience to have this time to, to discuss. We talked about so much uh, content today mm -hmm. and I would just leave with this. The the other thing that I've been, you know, studying a lot and, and working on personally is gratitude. And there's a lot of research on our brain and really focusing on on gratitude and and how our brain can be rewired, um, in in true authentic gratitude. And there there's so many things, but sometimes when things are very heavy, it's kind of like when we have a backpack that's only built for ten pounds, but we have twenty in it, and it feels like that backpack's gonna break. Sometimes our life feels like that. I feel like, and I know some of the survivors we serve certainly. Um, are going through that, but everyone, I mean, everyone is going through this, this journey of life. But when we, we take out a piece of paper and, and really write out what we're grateful for, and even if you pick two or three things, a lot of studies will say that because, you know, our, the way our brains, you know, after people listen to this podcast, I think what statistically Don, you could, could fact check me on this, but maybe 10% retention on our brain after we absorb something. Right. So if we just pick two or three things, which there's, I'm sure there's more in everyone's life. You know, the, the fact that we're, we're here and we're breathing and we're alive um, is one thing, you know, I'm grateful for, but if people really study that gratitude, and then again, I know that came up earlier, but you know, faith or not, I mean, I, some of us spoke either, either way, but just, just, there's so many things to be grateful for. Um, so I just leave with that. And, and I'd ask that I could please be excused and I'm going to go hang out with the fam. All right. You enjoy it. your family right. and it was wonderful to meet your, your children. They were just lovely. Thank you so much, Donna. Thanks for the opportunity. You guys have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us. Right. Take care. Bye. Spears, okay. real quick. Other parting thoughts. Yeah. Spears, you were going over the whole 
statistics and you mentioned something uh, about the joy of seeing from like whether it's people's clients in your case and in my case right now my students it's the lasting legacy of what am I leaving behind when my time on this earth is done in the sense of and yeah, I'll get a little personal here. I got a lot of health issues. Spears, you know it. You uh, you held uh, my barf bag once or twice while I laid uh, almost dying in the uh, commons. Um, I always tell that story, but it's the truth. But the reason why I say this is because it's like, okay, what am I leaving behind for the next generation? Am I leaving something not only to be remembered for myself, but so... In a few years from now, one of my students that I worked with that I got to see graduate this past June, which was probably the highest accomplished of my life professionally and possibly even personally, better than anything that I've accomplished on my own. I want it to be where five, maybe 10 years from now, they're like, oh, that's what so-and-so meant. It's that aha moment in life, which we all experience that. When I was younger, I didn't listen to my parents for a darn thing. But when it finally clicked, I'm like, oh, this is why my dad was so hard on me. Or this is why my high school teacher or my college professor was trying to drill this home in regards to whatever the scenario was. I get it now. It's that aha moment when you're seeing that in your students or in your clients or in, or in whatever. And it's just like, okay, there it is. And that's the lasting legacy. I think that's something that we're all trying to leave behind. I'm sure I'm certainly somebody who's trying to figure out like, okay, that's what I think is going to make me the most happiest of everything that I've accomplished so far. Let me help somebody else get there, or at least let me try to lay the foundation for someone else to potentially springboard into whatever it is they want to do next. And I'm still doing that. You talked about how you're keep, you keep in contact with your former students, myself included. I'm doing that right now. We just got done with graduation a month ago. Some of them are going off into college. I'm like, hey, here's my contact info, whatever you need from here on out. If you need me to be that support system positively in any way whatsoever, I am there at the drop of a dime. Um, to my underclassmen, I'm like, hey, when you graduate, all you got to do Here's my email. Send me an email. I will be at your graduation in the front. I don't care. I won't miss it. So to me, that's what I think is something in regards to the statistics that you had mentioned earlier about. I think we're all just trying to leave a lasting legacy of whatever that is before our time in this life is done and over with. I know that's probably like a long-winded response, but that's basically what it is. Well, you know, if you're looking for an answer to a question as significant as what brings us happiness in life, it kind of almost requires that we're going to have longer answers. You're not going to be able to answer. I mean, I don't know anybody who could answer that question in a sentence or two, Nico. So don't feel badly that you... Uh, spoke a little bit longer, there was a lot of wisdom in what you shared, and I agree with you entirely. So thank you. I appreciate that. Any other parting thoughts? I was going to say earlier, and I was just thinking about this, that I feel like the life cycle sort of goes backward, right? It's almost like a a, a perfect bell curve, and that as we get older, uh, and I, that's why I asked about that data, because I do think as we age, we start to be, I've noticed this just with my, um, you know, elderly family and friends that folks kind of get a little immature again. <laughs> um, you know, they start to kind of regress in a way, if you want to think about it like that. And then also that anxiety really ramps up. Like my grandma's 93 and she is, has so much anxiety. And so I do think that, um, back to that data, that there is something to be said for making sure we're, ta I just think in our society, we're not good at that either. We do, we pay so much attention to like the younger generation needs our help, but like the older generation needs our help too. 
And we do not do a very good job in that area. Yeah. So I would really like to see more focus on taking care, um, especially where mental health is concerned of our our elderly generation. Question, question if I can. Do you think it's because in regards to the older generation, and I don't know how uncensored I can be here. I wanted to use another S word here, but I won't. I'll use the PG one. Do you think it's because they've seen some stuff in their life to the point where they're just like, you know, they, they, they've seen their loved ones, you know, leave this, leave this world and move on. And they're still kind of there that that's why it's kind of like the whole regressing stage. I mean, it is part of life. Unfortunately, we are going to lose people that we're very close to, whether it's at an older age or whether it's even at a younger age, when we're not supposed to technically lose somebody that we're really close with, but it does happen. Um, so do you think that's just a fact of it too, that the older generation has kind of like seen some stuff to the point of why it leads to the part of them struggling to be happier because they're getting closer and close, I guess, getting closer and closer to the end. If we can word it that way or. It could be. I mean, I think that's a definite possibility. I know my my husband's um, grandma is the, almost exactly the same age as my grandma. And uh, she has been just wanting to go for a while because she's like, I'm, I'm good. You know, I'm good. I got it. Everything right. Like, I'm good. I'm ready. And so hers, uh, while, you know, there's still some sense of anxiety, I think it's less, it's not the same. And I don't know that my grandma has like a, a lot of sense of that. But I will also say, and this made me think of it earlier when Don was talking about people's environments and where they where they live physically, and we look can look at like I think it's Swedish the the concept of huga, like this idea of like even their vocabulary speaks to the way they live, and uh, and so there that's another thing. But I have uh, was talking to a friend recently about going on a mission trip, and she had had a similar experience that you, you know, if you've ever experienced something like that, where you're working with people in, in extreme poverty, you go into it thinking like, I'm here to help. And then what you realize is you get more out of it than they even do, because folks that don't have all the distractions and all the junk are so much happier in many ways than, than the rest of us. And so I guess I'm not really directly answering your question, Nico, because I think it really depends. I do think there is something to be said of the life cycle that like biologically, I think there is a regression. Um, and, and I'm obviously like there are other pieces of that, like hormones and all, all of these things that are, that are part of it. But I do believe that it, it also just kind of depends. And so I don't know that I would think that it's related to how much they've seen in their life. Cause I think there are some people who are 10 years old who have experienced more trauma than I ever hope to experience. I, I was just speaking more in the sense of because of the, what the data that Spears was going off of with the older generation. So that's basically from what I was going with there, but you're right. And you're right when you see people from like different parts of the world, you mentioned, uh, you know, about mission trips and stuff like that. People that go into that line of work when they think oh i'm getting into this to help you learn more from your the people you're working with or your clients or your clientele however you want to word that you i feel like you learn more from them because you get to understand that they appreciate the basics of what life i guess is supposed to be or like the basic understanding of human interaction or how most people will take basic human interaction over say technology which a lot of us are taking for granted even more and more now because we don't get that basic human interaction of just one-on-one -on -one. we're all in the world of our phones and our electronic devices could be and there's been a, a even over a, a you look at thoreau you know in his writings and he found pleasure out of simplicity and, you know, just minimizing things and being in the moment and changing your perspective. And I think when you do that, you know, when you're very elderly and you know you don't have a tremendous amount of time uh, remaining to you, many people 
And that's why I think that the trend of the 65 plus generally being the uh, least unhappy is that they don't have, you know, in, unless they are living in poverty or some type of very painful illness, you know, they don't have the distractions that a lot of people have of having to work uh, and, you know, chase a promotion or more money or whatever. You can just sit. I'm, I'm starting to uh, appreciate the older people who can just sit on a park bench and watch kids play and get joy out of that. You know, when I was younger, I just thought, how weird, you know, but I, I'm now, I can see that. Just seeing the joy of kids playing, especially in a playground where they're not putzing with their their electronics and they're playing on the slide and the monkey bars and the swings and just hearing the giggles like that, that gives me enormous joy and pleasure. And at one time in my life, it wouldn't have been as big of a factor as it is now. Not that I'm so ancient that I'm ready to uh, be found, you know, you know, tipped back on that park bench, but <laughs> I can begin to understand that experience more than I could when I was 20. But you are old enough to go, you know, slip back into that, you know, silly part we were talking about where where you're not so concerned about as many opinions of others and those random pieces of immaturity when we go back to being teenagers. Yeah, you can go back to being 12 years old. How yeah. close are you to your AARP card? <laughs> <laughs> John's closer than I am. Yes, yeah. I am. I'm the oldest <laughs> one here. So I found out that when I bought for my wife, uh, for her 50th birthday, a membership to AARP, and I had the uh, membership card propped up against some flowers and a vase. Um, she did not find joy in that. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious, but she didn't find it nearly as amusing. I'm, I'm picturing Carrie's reaction right now, and <laughs> oh yeah, great. Uh, times 10, Nico. It didn't <laughs> go well for me. <laughs> any other remaining things that we would like to uh bring up before we go i think this is a great discussion okay so hey, i did i will say one more thing i'm sorry yes. i just finished this book called how to human and it was written with this uh, perspective of the pandemic and it's by a black male. So his perspective, but then he does also bring in his spiritual perspective as well. Anyway, he talks about the importance of seeing others. And so I just want to circle back on, cause I, cause Nico said it and then you said something related to that, Don. And I think, I think what you're talking about with watching the kids playing at the park really is this, like, we just put everything else away and we just see other people. We just experience being with other people. And I think our society has moved away from that so much that it's really important to just try to intentionally get moments like that. I had one myself like that the other day. I was staying at a hotel and I was getting ready to go to a presentation and I was on my phone eating breakfast and this group of guys that have been friends for 35 years that were golfing, one of them starts talking to me. And then that just gets into this whole conversation. And it was a really great conversation. And it was just because one of them chose to see me. Right. And I was just choosing to be distracted. So I was thinking about that because it was, I had just finished the book and I was like, yep, yep. There it is. That importance of, of being seen. And I always say that even with you know, if homeless people are asking for money, which I rarely carry cash anymore, but uh, if I don't have cash, I still at least see them and say, you know, God bless you or whatever, and and at least acknowledge their existence because that's so important. We just don't, we just don't do that enough. It really is. And I, if you would be kind enough to email me the information mm -hmm. about the book, because what I'll do is 
uh, once we sign off, I will have a list of resources for people because I, of course, you know, we need to share with people the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, which is 988. You can call or you can text that. But uh, any of you who are on this call, if you've read something that has been particularly uh, inspiring to you in helping you find joy, uh, send it to me and I will include that as well. And the last thing that, that I will say, and it, it just kind of hopefully will put a nice uh, closing point on what both Leanne and Nico were just talking about with um, alienation and feeling alone. That's something that has been studied in sociology since Durkheim in the 1800s, where when people feel alienated from each other, which can happen from the lack of trust or the failure of our trusted institutions, which we're really experiencing right now. People don't trust in institutions. We're becoming more and more individualized. The very classic book by Robert Putnam, Bowling Alone, is about the same sort of a thing. He, it's as simple as he said, it, it, to the extent that people still bowl, they don't join the leagues and spend the time together on Saturdays. If they go, they'll go by themselves or just with their family. And that's just one simple example of ways in which we used to gather together as towns and communities. And you know, I don't know about you all, but from what I've been seeing and in my own family included, we just don't have family reunions anymore. That's something that past generations, you know, we would do that uh, religiously. We just knew, uh, now I forget which week in August, that was the family reunion weekend, and you better not make plans for that weekend. And it, it has just fallen by the wayside. And I think that those are all very important factors. And it's very easy not to be seen, to use uh, Leanne's expression. You, could, you can be in a very crowded, busy place. And if you are really focused on your phone or your tablet or whatever it is, I mean, it would have been very easy for that friend of yours just to think, you know, Leanne's busy. I don't want to bother her but you got so much pleasure out of them stopping to chat. And think, everybody, just think about how frequently that happens and how frequently we do that to other people too. So I, to me, one of the big keys to happiness is living in the moment, seeing everything that's around you, and appreciation or gratitude, as Ryan was saying. So I think that those are very important factors that don't require professional intervention or medication to do. But if you do feel as though you're, you're not suffering just uh, periodical and you know, appropriate sadness, don't be ashamed to reach out and get screened. And if you need medical assistance or therapy, there's no shame in it. But do keep in mind that short list that I just made about things that we can all do that'll cost us nothing. And they can help bring us closer to each other. So anything else that anyone would like to say? No, thank you so much for hosting us. Absolutely. I appreciate all of you so much. And we've got people from you know, all over the country and a wide range uh, of 
age and socioeconomics and and all sorts of things. And I think it led to, well, I, I was interested in how much, in spite all of that, that we found in common about what brings happiness. And I think that that's going to bring some value to the people who watch this podcast. So thank you all for being part of this discussion. I enjoyed it. I hope that you did as well. And I look forward to speaking to you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.